Pride and Prejudice by Jane Austen Read by S. D. Hudson Chapter 30 Sir William stayed only a week at Hunsford, but his visit was long enough to convince him of his daughter's being most comfortably settled, and of her possessing such a husband and such a neighbour as were not often met with. While Sir William was with them, Mr. Collins devoted his mornings to driving him out in his gig and showing him the country. But when he went away, the whole family returned to their usual employments, and Elizabeth was thankful to find they did not see more of her cousin by the alteration, for the chief of the time between breakfast and dinner was now passed by him either at work in the garden or in reading and writing and looking out of the window in his own book-room, which fronted the road. The room in which the ladies sat was backwards. Elizabeth at first had rather wondered that Charlotte should not prefer the dining parlour for common use. It was a better-sized room and had a pleasanter aspect. But she soon saw that her friend had an excellent reason for what she did. For Mr. Collins would undoubtedly have been much less in his own apartment had they sat in one equally lively, and she gave Charlotte credit for the arrangement. From the drawing-room they could distinguish nothing in the lane and were indebted to Mr. Collins for the knowledge of what carriages went along and how often especially Mr. Burr drove by in her phaeton, which he never failed coming in to inform them of, though it happened almost every day. She not unfrequently stopped at the parsonage and had a few minutes' conversation with Charlotte, but was scarcely ever prevailed on to get out. Very few days passed in which Mr. Collins did not walk to Rosings, and not many in which his wife did not think it necessary to go likewise. And till Elizabeth recollected that there might be other family livings to be disposed of, she could not understand the sacrifice of so many hours. Now and then they were honoured with a call from her ladyship, and nothing escaped her observation that was passing in the room during these visits. She examined into their employments, looked at their work, and advised them to do it differently, found fault with the arrangement of the furniture, or detected the housemaid in negligence, and if she accepted any refreshment, seemed to do it only for the sake of finding out that Mrs. Collins's joints of meat were too large for her family. Elizabeth soon perceived that though this great lady was not in the commission of the peace for the country, she was a most active magistrate in her own parish, the minutest concerns of which were carried to her by Mr. Collins, and whenever any of the cottagers were disposed to be quarrelsome, discontented or too poor, she sallied forth into the village to settle their differences, silence their complaints, and scold them into harmony and plenty. The entertainment of dining at Rosings was repeated about twice a week, and allowing for the loss of Sir William, and there being only one card table in the evening, every such entertainment was the counterpart of the first. Their other engagements were few, as the style of living of the neighbourhood in general was beyond the Collins's reach. This, however, was no evil to Elizabeth, and upon the whole she spent her time comfortably enough. There were half hours of pleasant conversation with Charlotte, and the weather was so fine for the time of year that she had often great enjoyment out of doors. Her favourite walk, and where she frequently went while the others were calling on Lady Catherine, was along the open grove which edged that side of the park where there was a nice sheltered path which no one seemed to value but herself, and where she felt beyond the reach of Lady Catherine's curiosity. 
In this quiet way, the first fortnight of her visit soon passed away. Easter was approaching, and the week preceding it was to bring an addition to the family at Rosings, which in so small a circle must be important. Elizabeth had heard soon after her arrival that Mr. Darcy was expected there in the course of a few weeks, and though there were not many of her acquaintance whom she did not prefer, his coming would furnish one comparatively new to looking at their Rosings parties, and she might be amused in seeing how hopeless Miss Bingley's designs on him were by his behaviour to his cousin, for whom he was evidently destined by Lady Catherine, who talked of his coming with the greatest satisfaction, spoke of him in terms of the highest admiration, and seemed almost angry to find that he had already been frequently seen by Miss Lucas and herself. His arrival was soon known at the parsonage, for Mr. Collins was walking the whole morning within view of the lodges opening into Hunsford Lane in order to have the earliest assurance of it, and after making his bow as the carriage turned into the park, hurried home with great intelligence. On the following morning he hastened to Rosings to pay his respects. There were two nephews of Lady Catherine to require them, for Mr. Darcy had brought with him a Colonel Fitzwilliam, the younger son of his uncle, and to the great surprise of all the party. When Mr. Collins returned, the gentleman accompanied him. Charlotte had seen them from her husband's room crossing the road, and immediately running into the other told the girls what an honour they might expect adding, I may thank you, Eliza, for this piece of civility. Mr. Darcy would never have come so soon to wait upon me. Elizabeth had scarcely time to disclaim all right to the compliment, before their approach was announced by the doorbell, and shortly afterwards the three gentlemen entered the room. Colonel Fitzwilliam, who led the way, was about thirty, not handsome, but in person and address most truly the gentleman. Mr. Darcy looked just as he had been used to look in Hertfordshire, paid his compliments with his usual reserve to Mrs. Collins, and whatever might be his feelings towards her friend, met her with every appearance of composure. Elizabeth merely curtsied to him without saying a word. Colonel Fitzwilliam entered into conversation directly with the readiness and ease of a well-bred man, and talked very pleasantly, but his cousin, after having addressed a slight observation on the house and garden to Mrs. Collins, sat for some time without speaking to anybody. At length, however, his civility was so far awakened as to inquire of Elizabeth after the health of her family. She answered him in the usual way, and after a moment's pause, added, My eldest sister has been in town these three months. Have you never happened to see her there? She was perfectly sensible that he never had, but she wished to see whether he would betray any consciousness of what had passed between the Bingleys and Jane, and she thought he looked a little confused, as he answered that he had never been so fortunate as to meet Miss Bennet. The subject was pursued no further, and the gentleman soon afterwards went away. Chapter 31 Colonel Fitzwilliam's manners were very much admired at the parsonage, and the ladies all felt he must add considerably to the pleasure of their engagements at Rosings. It was some days, however, before they received any invitation thither, for while there were visitors in the house, they could not be necessary, and it was not until Easter Day, almost a week after the gentleman's arrival, that they were honoured by such an attention, and then they were merely asked on leaving church to come there in the evening. For the last week they had seen very little of either Lady Catherine or her daughter, Colonel Fitzwilliam had called at the parsonage more than once during the time, but Mr. Darcy they had only seen at church. 
The invitation was accepted, of course, and at a proper hour they joined the party in Lady Catherine's drawing room. Her ladyship received them civilly, but it was plain that their company was by no means so acceptable as when she could get nobody else, and she was in fact almost engrossed by her nephews, speaking to them, especially to Darcy, much more than to any other person in the room. Colonel Fitzwilliam seemed really glad to see them. Anything was a welcome relief to him at Rosings, and Mrs. Collins' pretty friend had moreover caught his fancy very much. He now seated himself by her and talked so agreeable of Kent and Hertfordshire, of travelling and staying at home, of new books and music, that Elizabeth had never been half so well entertained in that room before and they conversed with so much spirit and flow as to draw the attention of Lady Catherine herself, as well as of Mr. Darcy. His eyes had been soon and repeatedly turned towards them with a look of curiosity, and that her ladyship after a while shared the feeling was more openly acknowledged, for she did not scruple to call out, "'What is it that you are saying, Fitzwilliam? "'What is it that you are talking of? "'What are you telling, Miss Bennet? "'Let me hear what it is.' "'We are speaking of music, madam,' said he, "'when no longer able to avoid a reply. "'Of music? "'Then pray speak aloud. "'It is of all subjects my delight. "'I must have my share in the conversation "'if you are speaking of music.' There are few people in England, I suppose, who have more true enjoyment of music than myself, or a better natural taste. If I had ever learnt, I should have been a great proficient, and so would Anne, if her health had allowed her to apply. I am confident that she would have performed delightfully. How does Georgiana get on, Darcy? Mr. Darcy spoke with affectionate praise of his sister's proficiency. I am very glad to hear such a good account of her, said Lady Catherine, and pray tell her from me she cannot expect to excel if she does not practice a great deal. I assure you, madam, he replied, that she does not need such advice. She practices very constantly. So much the better. It cannot be done too much. "'and when I next write to her, I shall charge her not to neglect it on any account. "'I often tell young ladies no excellence in music is to be acquired without constant practice. "'I have told Miss Bennet several times that she will never play really well unless she practices more. "'And though Mrs. Collins has no instrument, she is very welcome, "'as I have often told her to come to Rosings every day and play on the pianoforte, in Mrs. Jenkinson's room. She would be in nobody's way, you know, in that part of the house. Mr. Darcy looked a little ashamed of his aunt's ill-breeding, and made no answer. When coffee was over, Colonel Fitzwilliam reminded Elizabeth of having promised to play to him, and she sat down directly to the instrument. He drew a chair near her. Lady Catherine listened to half a song and then talked as before to her other nephew, till the latter walked away from her and, moving with his usual deliberation towards the pianoforte, stationed himself so as to command a full view of the fair performer's countenance. Elizabeth saw what he was doing, and at the first convenient pause, turned to him with an arch smile and said, you mean to frighten me, Mr. Darcy, by coming in all this state to hear me? But I will not be alarmed, though your sister does play so well. There is a stubbornness about me that never can bear to be frightened at the will of others. My courage always rises with every attempt to intimidate me. I shall not say that you are mistaken, he replied because you could not really believe me to entertain any design of alarming you, and I have had the pleasure of your acquaintance long enough to know 
that you find great enjoyment in occasionally professing opinions which are, in fact, not your own. Elizabeth laughed heartily at this picture of herself and said to Colonel Fitzwilliam, "'Your cousin will give you a very pretty notion of me "'and teach you not to believe a word I say. "'I am particularly unlucky in meeting with a person "'so well able to expose my real character "'in a part of the world where I had hoped to pass myself off "'with some degree of credit. "'Indeed, Mr. Darcy, it is very ungenerous of you "'to mention all that you knew to my disadvantage in Hertfordshire "'and give me leave to say,' Very impolite, too, for it is provoking me to retaliate, and such things may come out as will shock your relations to hear. I am not afraid of you, said he, smilingly. Pray let me hear what you have to accuse him of, cried Colonel Fitzwilliam. I should like to know how he behaves among strangers. You shall hear that. But prepare yourself for something very dreadful. The first time of my ever seeing him in Hertfordshire, you must know, was at a ball, and at this ball, what do you think he did? He danced only four dances. I am sorry to pain you, but so it was. He danced only four dances, though gentlemen were scarce, and to my certain knowledge more than one lady was sitting down in want of a partner. Mr. Darcy, you cannot deny the fact. I had not at that time the honour of knowing any lady in the assembly beyond my own party. True, and nobody can ever be introduced in a ballroom. Well, Colonel Fitzwilliam, what do I play next? My fingers await your orders. Perhaps, said Darcy, I should have judged better had I sought an introduction but I am ill-qualified to recommend myself to strangers. "'Shall we ask your cousin the reason of this?' said Elizabeth, still addressing Colonel Fitzwilliam. "'Shall we ask him why a man of sense and education, and who has lived in the world, is ill-qualified to recommend himself to strangers?' "'I can answer your question,' said Fitzwilliam, without applying to him. "'It is because he will not give himself the trouble.' "'I certainly have not the talent which some people possess,' said Darcy, "'of conversing easily with those I have never seen before. "'I cannot catch their tone of conversation "'or appear interested in their concerns as I often see done.' "'My fingers,' said Elizabeth, "'do not move over this instrument in the masterly manner "'which I see so many women's do.' They have not the same force or rapidity, and do not produce the same expression. But then I have always supposed it to be my own fault, because I would not take the trouble of practising. It is not that I do believe my fingers are capable, as any other woman's, of superior execution. Darcy smiled and said, You are perfectly right. You have employed your time much better. No one admitted to the privilege of hearing you can think anything wanting. We neither of us perform to strangers. Here they were interrupted by Lady Catherine, who called out to know what they were talking of. Elizabeth immediately began playing again. Lady Catherine approached, and after listening for a few minutes, said to Darcy, Miss Bennet would not play at all amiss if she practised more and could have the advantage of a London master. She has a very good notion of fingering, though her taste is not equal to Anne's. Anne would have been a delightful performer had her health allowed her to learn. Elizabeth looked at Darcy to see how cordially he assented to his cousin's praise. But neither at that moment, nor at any other, could she discern any symptom of love, and from the whole of his behaviour to Mr. Burr, she derived this comfort for Miss Bingley, that he might just have been as likely to marry her had she been his relation. Lady Catherine continued her remarks on Elizabeth's performance, 
mixing them with many instructions on execution and taste. Elizabeth received them with all the forbearance of civility, and, at the request of the gentleman, remained at the instrument till her ladyship's carriage was ready to take them all home. I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you did, please consider following me for more.